We acknowledge uh, that we, our event takes place on the lands of the Blackfoot people and the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. We pay respect to their past, present, and future cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship to this land. We commit to do our utmost to assist with efforts to mend and heal past and present injustices. Our speaker today is Martha Mathurin. Mo, sorry. I wanted to make sure I said it correctly. Uh, uh, Martha is the Executive Director of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, EDI, at the University of Lethbridge. Born and raised in uh, St. Lucia, uh, West Indies, Martha uh, Mathewan Mo holds a BA degree from the Univer uh, Universidad Central de uh, La Villa uh, in Cuba, a Master's of Education in Educational Psychology from uh, the University of Regina, and is a doctoral candidate in curriculum and instruction. Martha Moe's experience uh, consists of 10 years in the banking and finance industry and eight years in uh, international education. Uh, previous roles include management of talent uh, development at the Public Service uh, Commission, Government of Saskatchewan, and Associate Director of Study Abroad and Mobility at UR International at the University of Regina. Uh, Methuen Moe's work in international education has afforded her uh, the possibilities or possibility to part uh, participate in education forums in Brazil, Canada, China, Cuba, Mexico, Germany, Italy, and the United States. She is a skilled facilitator and advocate for equitable and inclusive workplaces for all. Person we need to have for sure. Uh, uh, Methuen Mo is very passionate about teaching and focuses a lot of her uh, research on uh, cross-cultural communication, internationalization of curriculum, as well as reshaping the perception of studying abroad and the importance of inclusive teaching. Methuen Mo believes that learning is organic and constant, and it is constantly changing. Uh, but being uh, represented in the learning space is just as equally important. Methuen Moe's uh, research focuses on the shifting identities in international uh, graduate students as, um, assume while transitioning uh, into a new educational uh, setting. Uh, this, is, uh, this is why she is very keen on developing learning opportunities that create an environment where all students, no matter race, gender, gender expression, neurodiversity, or ethnic background uh, feel represented in the learning space in which they are. During her free time, and she does have a little free time, uh, she enjoys cooking, reading, and traveling with her partner, Jared. Uh, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Martha. I'm going to do my best, like Marie, and project my voice, but hopefully it works. Can you hear me at the back? Okay? No? Can you hear me? Okay. Okay, I'll do my very best to project my voice, okay? <clears throat> So, Oki, and thank you for having me. Thank you, Marie, for this uh, very warm welcome. Um, before I begin today, I want to position myself and who I am. 
My pronouns are she and her, and my Blackfoot name that I have been blessed to, I was given by Elder Francis for a charter, is Akasimoto, meaning a person who's come from a long time ago. Today I have an opportunity to share with you what I usually like to call a window of interpretation as it relates to debunking and demystifying the myths and misconceptions about what equity, diversity, and inclusion work is about. But more importantly, what that work is for post-secondary institutions and for the broader community. But before I begin, I want to position that I'm a guest as an immigrant settler on this traditional land of the Blackfoot Confederacy and I do not take for granted that I have the opportunity to work, learn, and live on this land. I navigate an intersectional identity as a woman of color, as a critical feminist race scholar, as a daughter of descendants of African slaves, and as a former international graduate student. I will share many things with you today, which I hope I'm going to be able to do. It will be complex and it will be uncomfortable. But what I hope that you learn or you take away from today is that you remember the difference is an opportunity for innovation and creativity. And if we would only allow ourselves to be open to curiosity. So my intentions today are fourfold. I want to increase our understanding of what the purpose and the intention is of equity work and anti-racism work disrupt some of the myths and the misconceptions that there surrounds this work, because I know it's very polarizing and very complex work. I'm gonna unpack what I usually call a business and an ethical case for EDI work, and then I'm gonna open the space for brave conversation. So like I said, it will be uncomfortable, it will be complex, but I hope that you brace and you just lean into the discomfort as we move through this journey today. So to help us set um, an overview of what I'm gonna cover today, I'm gonna cover some key definitions and some concepts that you probably have been hearing a lot being used about what it is and what this work is not. I'm gonna set the context about what this looks like in a post-secondary context, and we'll talk about what is the business case around EDI work, and then we'll look at five myths and misconceptions. There are several, but I'm gonna focus on five huge buckets that I think are very common, that are also very unsettling and, and, and sometimes a bit confusing about what this work is intending to do and not intending to do. We'll also talk about the dangers of performative allyship and what that means, and then I'll look at calling, uh, sharing a video. Hopefully it works. I didn't realize to check for um, Wi-Fi, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about some of the calls to actions that we as a community and as a post-secondary institution can be working towards. And then I will take your questions at the end. So the key concept that I want to position first today is when we talk about the concept of diversity, <laughs> what are we talking about? And I want to use an analogy of going to a party. So diversity asks the question about what are the various ways individuals are uniquely different? So be it race, be it gender, gender expression, neurodiversity, but ask the question really, who has been invited to the party or who's in the room? And when we think of the concept of equity, equity is simply referring to a fair treatment, creating of access and opportunity for advancement, but it's asking the question, who has been included in the room? And when we think of the concept of inclusion, it usually speaks to has all the persons within the spaces, no matter what diversity dimensions they navigate, do they feel seen, do they feel heard, and do they feel safe in the spaces and the places that they navigate? The second concept that I want to define today is the concept of racism and why this work is very important. So Al Shahabi is a, 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 a person in the field of equity, diversity, and inclusion, and she did some work for Universities Canada, and she uses the following terms to define racism. She defines racism as a social construct or within the social discourse, and it's defined as systems and structures that exclude, that exercise power of one group over another group of people, and that could be based on skin color, implicit or explicit sets of biases or beliefs, or sometimes erroneous assumptions 
and actions that is based on racial superiority. So when we further strip back what that concept is, it could be in threefold. It could be what is individual racism, we could look at institutional racism, and we could also look at structural racism where we look at how policies and process allow the pervasiveness of a specific culture. So this work, when we talk about this work, we are always trying to unpack what we call diversity mentions. And what I want to talk about diversity mentions is I wanted to position that we as individuals navigate not one identity, but multiplicities of identities, okay? And then Rosamund Loden talks about four key dimensions that we need to be constantly aware of that we are always navigating. So at the initial beginning, I stated that I'm a woman who navigated intersecting identity because I have very different things that make up who I am as a person. So the first is normally what we call a personality. Are we very in introverted? Are we very extroverted? Are we open to unknown or unfamiliar? The third, the second is what we call our internal or primary dimensions, which you usually see above the water, like your age, your race, your skin color, sexual orientation, ability or ethnicity. And these are the ones that are very visible that you can see above the water. The third dimension is usually what we call um, external dimensions, is geographic location, where you live, what educational background that you have, what's your income, what's your socioeconomic status, parental or marital status. And the fourth dimension is usually what we call organizational dimensions, is where are you working? What part of the unit are you? Are you in a unionized or a non-unionized environment? Are you a manager or not? Like, it really talks about how you are positioned. I think you keep going in and out. Okay. The second thing I want to talk about today, I think I maybe have to stay really close, is microaggressions. Okay? So a lot of you may have heard this term, but I'm not normally understand what it means and what are the implications of it. So when we talk about microaggressions, we're looking at small, subtle, automatic put downs or everyday oppressions that sometimes go unseen or unacknowledged. For example, someone makes a very sexist or gendered joke and says, oh, this person should not have gotten this job because they are a woman, for example. And then someone says, oh, that's okay, he, she, or they, that's just who they are. They didn't mean anything by it. So by doing that, you invalidate the experiences that the person has, has actually gone through. And that's what when we talk about microaggressions, we say they're very subtle, they're like constant cuts that you receive because based on what someone has said. It's okay, Mary, I'm here. I'm used to navigating small spaces, so not to worry. The other term that I want to position today is what we call racial gaslighting. And what does that mean? It's a form of maintaining power by denying or dismissing an experience of a racialized or a person of color. So we have to be very careful when someone says, this makes me uncomfortable, or I have experienced this, we have to get curious and understand what is happening for them, because we don't want to be invalidating or diminishing that experience. What are some of the common forms of oppression or discrimination that this work addresses? So many of you heard this person is very ableist, like everybody here doesn't have a disability, or someone says they're very ageist, is like we don't want to give someone an opportunity because we think they're too old or they have too much experience. So these are some of the common manifestations of how this can act, these forms of oppression can actually show up in everyday in everyday spaces. So I just wanted to position that for you so you understand the lens that I'm working through here this morning. So you asked me, well, Martha, what does this have to do with the work that you're doing? So I'm gonna use an analogy of a shoe, which is something very common. We all have to wear a shoe. If we wanna go somewhere, we wear a shoe. So when we think of equality, it's about everyone getting a pair of shoes, okay? And when we think of diversity, it's about giving everybody a different kind of shoe. 
And equity work is really about ensuring that everyone has a shoe that fits them. So they don't get a big shoe, they don't get an uncomfortable shoe, they get a shoe that fits them. And acceptance is about understanding that we all wear different kinds of shoes. But the goal with this work is truly about creating an authentic, safe space of belonging. And what that work is trying to do is simply say that you can wear the shoe that you like in the style that you choose to, and that is comfortable for you, but you do not feel excluded or judged by the shoe that you're wearing. So I, didn't, I don't mean to trivialize it, but I think it's just a very clear way of presenting what this work is intending to do. It's intending to build an authentic space of belonging for everyone, no matter how they show up in the places and the spaces that they navigate. So you will ask me this question about, well, Martha, well, what does this have to do with anything? But for you to understand the purpose of this work, you have to understand the history or the, or the past and how that has contributed to where we are today. So we would look at what happened in 2020, and we were all had to navigate a very unprecedented COVID-19 pandemic, right? We all had to watch the, the, the killing of George Floyd on our TV screens, but we were to watch for eight minutes and 60 sec six seconds. We all saw the absurgence of the Me Too movement. We all saw the resurgence of the Black Lives Matter movement. And most importantly in Canada, we learned about the discovery of unmarked grave of the children in residential schools. So the significant moments, I would say, disrupted our ability as an institution, but also as a community, to deny the existence of deep racial and social issues not only in the US, but also in Canada. Post-secondary institutions, corporate Canada, provincial and federal governments, tri-councils, could not unsee the dehumanization of indigenous black and brown bodies and were called out to become part of the solution to addressing these inequities. Although these instances or these situations were of great importance in pivoting or pushing to the center critical issues of injust social injustices, I would argue that many indigenous black and brown bodies have always been aware of those issues, but yet have to continuously been pushed to the margins even though they have had to call out and fight on these social injustices. So let me set the context for you a little further. So the challenge and the danger, I think, and I would argue, is that Canada sometimes as a country is positioned as very welcoming, tolerant, multicultural, but suffers what is usually called an angel complex. So the public discourse would usually say, well, there's no issue here. We are open and welcoming. This is a US issue. This is not a Canadian issue. There are growing, polarizing views about what critical race theory is and what it's not. It makes us feel bad about ourselves. But there's also a growing misinformation about polarizing views about what equity work is and what it is not. And most recently, it's about this wokeness, about I'm being woke and, and I'm so trying to do the right thing. But the challenge is the acknowledgement of these issues is simply saying that there is an issue that has to be addressed, but yes, it is a very complex, but also very uncomfortable issue. So Statistics Canada states that despite the emphasis on Canada being very multicultural, about social equality and public policy, persons living in Canada have not always been treated equally. Our indigenous people, those who are designated as visible minorities, generally report feeling less safe than the rest of the population, and in most cases are overrepresented within the justice system. Similarly, the average pay for a visible minority, when we say visible minority, we talk about racialized or historically excluded voices, receive 30% lower pay in a similar size organization. And additionally, which we also saw during the COVID-19 pandemic, that 
persons who are at greater risk of physical and mental health due to structural and institutional racism. So Canada has a, has a history, what I would like to say, we have to acknowledge, we have to know where we've come from to know where we're going, is Canada has been based on very colonial structures. There's been a history of slavery, indentured servitude, segregation, exclusionary immigration policy, and also the resurgence of white nationalist ideologies. So the acknowledgement of that history is a critical part of acknowledging we need to know the truth for there to be justice and therefore there to be action to address the inequities. And you may ask this question, but what does this have to do with Alberta? So one of our professors, Dr. Jenny Bailey from the Center for Oral History and Traditions, did a really interesting documentary where she tried to unpack what is the history of racialized and social injustice issues in, in our southern Alberta, specifically, and put together a really great documentary called Black Lives in Alberta, 100 Years of Racial Injustice. I really encourage you to watch it. It's phenomenal to hear what the experiences have been. But Sarah Ahmed says that the body that causes discomfort is the one that always has to work hard to make others uncomfortable. So it's about ensuring that we acknowledge that there are inequities and what are we going to do as a community and as an institution to address those inequities. So you cannot talk about this work without talking about power. Because power is always at the very center of equity issues. And when we talk about power, we talk about power as being performative, positioning, and legitimizing truth. And it also talks about who do we define as good or competent, good scholar, good researcher, good community member, good citizen. So whoever is holding the power has a lot of influence in determining and, and managing how that is manifested. So power always comes into what we call a power and policy issue, whether institutional and structural power, but also how hegemonic systems of power continuously push specific voices and stories to the periphery. So I'm going to give an analogy. So what if, what if this work was really about removing fences and boxes and allowing all of us to be at the playing field and looking at the game without feeling judged or feeling unsafe or worrying about how we have been positioned in this space. So I think I don't have internet, so I'm not going to play this video. I don't think I have internet, right, Laurie? I don't think so. Okay, so I'm just, I'm going to share this video with Laurie so she can share it with the body group. But this was a really great video that says inclusion work is not about singling one group over the other. It's about you and I. It's about making sure that you see the humanity in each and every one of us. So I'm going to just go forward. So why does this work matter in academic spaces? So as educational institutions, we have been built on colonial structures that have excluded specific voices and identities and stories epistemology within the academic discourse. So educational institutions are also agents of change that disrupt and expand scholarship. And as a place also of discovery and debate and has an ethical responsibility to address the systemic issues. So we as an institution have a critical role to play in making sure that we create safe spaces for all the students, staff, and faculty who come to our university, but also to give back to the communities that we are a part of. And you will ask the next question is like, well, is this taking away from one to get into the other? There is a really strong legislative framework that informs this work. There is the Employment Equity Act, the Canadian, the Canadian Charter of Rights, and the Human Rights Codes that have been set up to ensure that everyone gets access and opportunity to, um, to just have a really great quality of life. So when we as an institution look at this work, it's really about building better educational outcomes and experiences for all our faculty, staff, and students and the community. It's about creating safe, accessible spaces for all. It's about an examination of policies and processes that have excluded specific voices. 
It's about an ethical responsibility to lead the way in addressing systemic barriers in education, but most importantly, it's about building inclusive excellence within our institutions and the communities that we are part of. So I, have, I said I was gonna talk really quickly about a few myths, and I think I have about five-ish more minutes. I just wanna cover about some of the myths. So my, most of you have heard of the term meritocracy. I've worked really hard for what I have, and everyone just needs to figure out how to work hard and to get over it. But the reality is the research, the data has shown that specific stories and voices don't always have the same access to opportunities. For example, women in underrepresented, in underrepresented roles or professions have to work three times as hard just to show themselves equal or as, as competent. Or the pay differences between men and women in specific um, employment groups is uniquely different. So how are we going to address those gaps? The second one is that this work is about lowering the standards. So it's about giving everybody a free pass to get into a specific area. It's not about doing that. It's about simply re-leveling the field to make sure that access is open up to a broader group of people. So it's not about lowering standards, it's about making sure everyone gets access to it. If you're disabled, if you're someone who positions yourself as transgender or queer, you have an opportunity to get access to employment. The third one is that this causes more harm than good. And I always find um, this one to be very tricky because certain voices may feel that they're being pushed to the sides, and I think it's not about pushing to the sides, it's about opening the space. So I will always use the analogy of a being at a table and you're in a room with everyone and moving the table and opening up the space and putting more chairs so that people could actually sit and have a conversation. The third, the fourth is about it takes from one group to another. And my argument is always, so what if one group never got access to it in the first place? So should we not be looking at making sure that everybody gets access without hurting anyone and simply opening up the spaces? And the fifth one, which is the most problematic one, I think, is that I treat everyone the same. When you treat everyone the same, you negate the uniqueness. Remember at the beginning I talked about diversity and how equity is about giving people the shoes that they need so they can feel comfortable. We do not want to negate the uniqueness that each individual brings to the space. Because the more diverse your teams, your groups are, the more innovative and the more high performing that these particular groups are. And it really impacts your bottom line. So a lot of this work has been happening. 2020 happened. Lots of interesting statements came out. We're going to be doing this. And when you go back and you look at this, you see, well, what has happened? And the, 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 the issue is we have to be very careful that we're not being performative in our, in our approaches. It's about not getting stuck in the good, feel good performative policy or weaponizing EDI issues. It's a, and the failure of these programs is that I can't just tell someone, go and take an unconscious bias training and that will fix the problem. Unconscious bias is unconscious, it's automatic. We all have them, I have them. It's about doing the intentional work to make everyone feel that they are seen no matter how uniquely different they show up in the spaces. So equity work has to be intentional, impactful, sustainable change. It has to be consistent and congruent. And there must be an accountability, a speaking up, and a calling in when you see things happening. So this is what's happening to us when we are going through this space. We go from resistance, this is like, well, what is, why are we doing this? This is just making things more complicated, you know? But you're going from a resistant phase to an advocate. So you're going to feel uncomfortable. There's gonna be a lot of fear around this work because it is very hard work. I'm, I'm not gonna be naive and tell you that it is this easy work, it's really tough work. But we can only do it when we acknowledge the truth that we are, we are trying to correct and we make the effort to work together collectively. And I've seen you stand up, Marie, so give me a second and I'm just gonna flip to 
So here's my call to action to all of you and to myself, that we work on building more anti-racist organizations, that it's a collective responsibility for leaders, staff, our alumni, our community, that we think about the importance of creating safe spaces of belonging, and I talk about psychologically safe spaces remove systemic barriers, we develop policies and practices that are more inclusive, we are open to recruiting people who look different than we do or have a different expertise than we do, but we are also about creating an inclusive culture within our communities and within our institutions. So my call to you is that now that you know, we can no longer unsee it, and it's, about, it's an ethical responsibility to address it and to make this a better place for future generations. And with that, I'm going to say thank you and take any questions you have. Thank you, Martha. Thank you. That was. Uh, Certainly for me, it was an incredible presentation and, in fact, empowering. Uh, so I'd like to begin with some uh, thank yous. Uh, thank you first to LSCO for uh, allowing us to use this room for free. And I thank you for uh, purchasing uh, food from the lunch counter because that helps sustain uh, the uh, LSCO. Uh, thank you to the uh, University of Lethbridge for its, sorry, its ongoing support. And uh, thank you to Shaw TV and Bridge uh, City TV for recording and airing uh, our sessions. And uh, today we had it, uh, it's being recorded on that uh, phone. Um, some announcements. Next week's speaker is Mandy Sandbeck of Lethbridge Sustainability Association. Her, present, or her presentation is entitled, A Walk Through Growing Relationships and Growing Food. How to Create Relationships to Increase Our Food Resiliency. Uh, now, I, it is the time for some questions. So please state your name when you come up and your question briefly, uh, not long uh, preludes, please. Uh, written questions legibly signed uh, will be asked by me if you'd like to uh, do that. So um, I think I have somebody here ready to ask a question. And uh, OK. As soon as they finish squabbling, I'll like who goes first. All right, thank you. Yeah, we can do that. We've known each other over 44 years. I, my name is David Major. And um, I would like to ask your, uh, I'd like to get your response on the one drop rule. Uh, and I should say that I'm a father of biracial children. Mm -hmm. But it bothers me when I see in the news that some young fellow who's mother is white and his father is black or vice versa is a black person why uh, could you comment on that and that and i think that goes back to the one drop rule which yeah. i'm sure you're well aware yeah that's a hard question that's a hard question i don't think there's a right or wrong answer um So this is what I'm going to say, and this is my personal opinion about the one drop rule. First of all, I think identity is, like I talked about previously, is intersectional. So however you choose to position your identity is really an individual decision. Like I would not, see, if a person chooses to identify as black, there's that option. But I know there's the physiological about the blood quotient and how much of that is makes you more black or makes you more white. I try not to um, make a general, sorry, I try not to make a general response to that. I think that's a personal decision. And I think the individual has to say, how do I want to be positioned? Because if you notice, when I started, I was very clear in positioning how I wanted to be seen or to be identified in the space. So I don't think there's a right or wrong answer, to be very honest. I think it's a very personal decision. 
Um, and sometimes people don't push back on how they get positioned. That's why I said EDI work really comes down to a power issue, like who decides how they get positioned or not positioned. So I don't know if that helps you. There's no right or wrong answer. That's a very controversial, complex question. Um, but I do think personal decision has to play a significant part in that. So I don't know, you don't seem convinced, but I would just well, leave that. Well, the only thing I would add to sure. that is uh, if the media or society is taking advantage of that one drop rule to make a, a judgment, then how do we get them Stop doing that. Well, we should call them out on it. I please, think. Please repeat the question. It won't be on the Oh, sorry. He was saying, like, how does uh, how do you challenge society about that one drop rule? I think the person should push back. When a story is being done about me or someone else, they need to be very clear about how do they want to be positioned and how do they want to be identified. I don't think you should give away your power and let someone else position you. I think you should actually say, here's how. I want to be positioned in this space. So I urge people to speak up and call in and say, well, no, here's who I am and how I position myself. I don't know. It's a very, it's a very complex, very, very, very personal, polarizing question. Sorry. Sorry. You could sit here if you like. Hi, I'm Henning Mundell. Am I on? Can you hear me? Okay. Uh, my question relates to it's been half a century since I attended university, and I attended at three places, Vancouver, California, Davis, and Manitoba, and nowhere have I ever heard of a position like what you now have mm -hmm. at here at U of L since last year. Mm -hmm. How widespread are positions like that now in Canada and mm -hmm. universities? So, Great question, Kenny. Um, this position, I would say, has been very well positioned in places like the United States and other areas, but is very new to Canada. And the reason that a lot of it came about was Universities Canada, which is the huge body that all post-secondary institutions are members of, were thinking about how do we serve our, our university members with the upcoming issues, because there was a lot of things that pushed the movement. I think 2020 was a very pivotal year when there were the discovery of the unmarked graves. It's like, we could not unsee it. I think it was pushed to the center and we had to discuss it and there had to be work done. And a lot of the universities said, well, we don't have the expertise, so what do we do to build capacity? So my role here is really about building knowledge, building capacity, um, building strategies and policies so that we can address it. So this position is in predominantly a lot of universities and anyone who doesn't have it is actually actively recruiting people to come into this role. Because it's a lot of specialized research, you have to do a lot of human rights work background, you have to have a lot of work in managing social and racial issues. It's a very unique skill set, um, but you also have to be really knowledgeable in university administration as well. So yes, to your question, oh, there's a lot of universities in this role. Uh, it's not only the U of L, um, and I think we're going to keep seeing more of it coming because there's so much other things we have to do. Thank you. Sorry. <clears throat> My name is Mark Dettel. There, Mark. <laughs> uh, there are policies and even legislation by uh, that force, or the policies of companies or even governments, that the diversity of their uh, employees must reflect that of the diversity of the popul general population. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you think that is that really realistic? Is this really a, a move forward? Is that really the answer to this? Or what are your views on these type of uh, legislations and policies? Good question. Okay. Um, so the question on um, the uh, quotas or targets for diversity representation, I think it could be a good and a bad thing. And here's what I think. The good thing is it forces us to really strategically think about do we have all the knowledge and expertise, the diverse knowledge and expertise within our organization. The tricky part of that is when we bring these diverse voices into the organization, that they don't feel safe, they don't feel represented, or we can't retain them, that is problematic. I think when organizations only stop on recruiting diverse candidates, 
they're just being very compliant with the legislation. I think it's really a broader uh, process of how do we make sure we bring them in, we grow them in the organization, and we retain them so that they can actually move into to higher levels. So this one is like a, it's a balancing of, yes, we want diversity, but we also want representation, we want inclusion, and we also want to create retention of these diverse voices. So it's, I think a lot of, it's easy to do the diverse and say I've met the target. The hard work is about the environment, the psychological safety and opportunities for advancement is the tricky part. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah. That was a great question. Yeah, excellent question. Thank you. Martha, thank you very much for a fabulous presentation. Um, it really, uh, the way you've explained it is really on the ground um, reality of diversity. I have a couple of questions here. Um, and I think this might fall into your structural uh, type of uh, issue. But, so the one question is, who, who, um, who's choosing the shoes that you spoke about? Mm -hmm. And my second, I'm just wondering if you could give examples of uh, when you talk about weaponizing the EDIB, could you give some on the ground examples of that? Mm -hmm. Laurie, your name for oh. the recording. Thank you. My name is Laurie Schultz. Okay. I really like your question about um, who is choosing the shoes. So I want to I want to circle back to what I said earlier in the presentation. I talk about um, power is a power and policy issue. Okay. So it's two things. I can decide what the shoe looks like for me, and I can say to my colleague, you know what? For me to be very effective in this role, here's the supports that I need so I can be successful. I can give that. But if it's not reciprocated or received, then did it even matter that I said what kind of shoe that I need? So it's a balancing of what the individual needs and what the organization needs to make that final decision on what is that shoe's gonna look like. Because I think we always go to, I give, I treat everybody the same, and I give everybody the same thing, so nobody feels that they are advantage over the other. But it's, the, it's actually problematic to do that. You have to actually talk to the people that work for you, talk to your community and say, what does the community need? What do my staff need? So that I can actually meet them halfway, but they also have to meet me the other way. So it's really a balancing of rights. Like a lot of this work is really about a balancing of rights. It's about not always giving people absolutely everything they need, but giving them what they need to be successful within the limits of what the organization is able to do. But the organization also has to challenge itself to say, have I done the bare minimum or can I do better? Because the organ I know most of you probably are hearing about um, the great resignation and the quiet quitting and all these phenomena. The research is showing you that the organizations that are more flexible, more inclusive, are attracting the best and the brightest talent. They're leaving their organizations to go work for someone that they feel more psychologically safe with. So do you want to get the best or are you going to focus on how do you make your employees want to stay with you, is my question. The second thing about the weaponizing is that we hear it a lot that um, this is pushing away, when we talk about, and I want you to take this with a grain of salt, I'm just giving you a very clear example, white male, middle class men feel that they're being pushed to the peripheries because there is more space for racialized or gender or women, like especially in the underrepresented areas like STEM, so science, technology, engineering, math, you see there's a lot of concerns about, well, why do I need more women in this field? Like, why do they need to be here? But so I think there, that's some, some actual examples, but I, my, my argument is usually, but what if you and your colleague could come up with a new way of teaching math. Like, why do you see it as a taking away of you to, to give to someone else? Why can you not see it as an opportunity to innovate and collaborate together? So this EDI work is not about um, singling out men over women or racialized over others. It's about how can we see the human, the human in each of us, the humanness, the humanity in each of us so that we can make this a better place. I mean, I want to go to a place where I feel happy and safe. Like, I'm sure you all want to go 
a place where you feel happy and safe. So what does that look like for your generations that come after you, right? So that's an example of how it's weaponized. Um, another one is about I didn't get, I only got the job because I was a woman. No, like you got the job because you were a woman. Yes, but you were very competent scholar or researcher, and that's why you got the job. So it's about it's about challenging the fragility and the fear that comes around this work is really what our work is about, and to correcting some misconceptions and I guess myths about what this work is intending to do and it's not intending to do. Does that help you? Okay. Go ahead. Sorry. I'm sorry about my long-winded answers. Just like to give context. Go ahead. Sorry. Leona Jacobs. So. Um, Earlier on, in response to the first question, you said it's about how a person identifies yep. himself. And uh, take that point. However, I think that it's, this issue is not just complex, it's very confusing. Yes, please. Please speak into the mic. And it's confusing because, for example, we have some very high profile cases such as Joseph Boyden. There's one which I just heard about on the news last night where a high profile judge has been challenged on her identity as a First Nations person. Um, a status Indian. Um, so, and, and so how do you reconcile, or I, I guess I'd like to hear your thoughts on the idea of the technicalities of when you can claim a particular identity or not? That's a loaded question. <laughs> so I'm gonna give you an example of how uh, we, we do it. So for example, if a position is designated um, for, and there's a lot of controversy about identifying as indigenous or non-indigenous right now in academia and all it's happening okay I'm going to use what dr. Leroy little bear always says and he says if it's going to benefit the person to advance in a particular like so they have to be a person a Métis or an Inuit to get a position there needs to be a way of determining how that person identifies. It could be a voluntary, it's like some universities do voluntary self-identification, and other universities do a verified, so they either provide a status card, a letter of confirmation from their band or nation. It is very, very evolving and complex. I don't think anyone has figured out the right formula to be very honest about how do we do that. But in my view, I always look at it is, is this advantaging this person to get access to resources that someone else should be getting to getting access to or not is always the leading question that I use in this work. But I will tell you, I don't think there's a correct answer and I think it's still an evolving state. Um, I don't know if that gives you some context. I think it's like, like I go back to, I know the part when you said about it's confusing and that's why I said it's a balancing. Like I, I don't think, it's like a fine, I every day at work, I do a fine dance of how do I balance the institutional and the individual's need and I don't violate the human rights. So that's what I'm doing every single day that I do my work. How do I see the person, how they identify, how they position, but with what I have and the parameters that I have to work with, but not violate it. So it's like there is no perfect formula and everybody is really different. So I don't know. I don't think there's an answer to that one. That one is a really loaded question. But I would get. I would argue. I would give you. I would. My call out to you is think about it. Like, how would you would have wanted to be treated in a situation where if your identification impacts your ability to get or not get access to a job? I don't know. That might be the question. I don't know. So, but loaded question. Thank you. Does that help you at all? Um, I didn't need the help. I, I guess no. the the, uh, so the thing is is that there's just so much controversy right now. There was a mm -hmm. W5 or fifth state documentary on the issue. Mm -hmm. um, there were, I mean, and it's not just indigenous, it's across yeah, the board. Yeah. There's the, the uh, so so it's, I think that's some of the churn that's happening yeah. around this, is mm -hmm. that people are just, people who identify, and yet then they get called out in terms of, well, prove it. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it kind of cuts, I mean, the external world can identify other people, and that's perhaps not on. Mm -hmm. But then, at the same time, when you identify, and then you get challenged on it. Of course, yeah. And and I need to say, when I say this helpful, I mean like this. That means sorry, I didn't mean that. But yeah, I think it's a very loaded question for sure. And I don't think I have a right or wrong answer to that. 
to be honest. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Kurt Peterson, and uh, my question relates to the importance of teaching kids early childhood education as school curriculum uh, because as you say you, every, almost everybody has an un unconscious bias so can you speak a little bit about the importance of early childhood education and uh, school in general? Mm -hmm. okay. I just want to make sure I understand your question is about how do you create um, an awareness that we do see difference and we do treat people differently? Is that what you're asking? From, okay. Um, now, this is also a very controversial uh, topic because some people, parents think that by talking about those issues too early with students, make them feel bad about themselves or cause a very polarizing view. And I would argue, you know, I think there's a lot we could learn from, from kids because kids are curious about people. And I think we need to harness that curiosity and and the openness. So I would say that I do think we should be creating that curious the curious sense of wonder, and we should harness that and actually let the, let them know that the world is very different of them because of how you show up. Like I remember um, my colleagues who have biracial kids, and they tell them about this is how the world is going to see you, and 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 you need to be aware of it. Sometimes is to keep their kids safe. Sometimes is to um, make them not be naive about what the world is about. So I do think we should be teaching it and having hard conversations when it's appropriate. But I do think we should not um, avoid it completely because when they get to spaces where they see things that are different, it's overwhelming for the kids. And I think kids are curious. So we should harness that curiosity. But I, I think it should be taught. That's just my personal opinion. Does that answer your question? Beth Mundell Atherstone, thank you very much. Congratulations on your position and on your research. As this uh, field is evolving and we're learning more about how we see things and how we define others, um, I'm wondering. What steps do you see from it going from the academic to the political to action and change for the individuals who are making less money, who are put into positions where they have no power? How do you see that change occurring? Thank you. Thank you. Great question. Um, what I would say or what I would argue is that this work is not going to go away, first and foremost. It's not going to go away. So long that there are inequities, there's going to be this work. I'm actually trying to work myself out of a job. But I don't have to do this work because the world is great and there's nothing wrong with it. But the reality is I think it's going to keep continuing. The research is still evolving. I don't think there is any right formula of how to do it or not to do it because there is stuff coming out in the research that's disrupting that discourse as well. Um, what I think is, it, it's about critical thinking and I think it's really about accountability. I think as I think we, as, as community members, have a responsibility to one, learn, listen, educate ourselves so that we can hold people accountable. Um, and I don't think it's a one person job like the EDI or the Chief Diversity Office is going to come and fix the problem. That's a misconception. I think it's a collective responsibility that both political leaders, you know, university leaders, community members, we all have a piece of the puzzle to make this a better society for everyone. So like, I don't think it's going to go away. I think it's going to get more polarizing, to be quite honest. Um, but I think there has to be some, I'm stubbornly hopeful, like John Lewis would say, that one day that this will be a place and we don't even have to do this anymore. So that's what I'm going to say to that question. Okay, we're going to have one last question because our time is just about up. So Trevor, please. Excuse me. Uh, Trevor Page, 
Uh, since the overall objective is to break down barriers and conflict between races, to what extent do you think that intermarriage between the races will resolve the problem? <laughs> I wasn't anticipating these really tough questions, but excellent question. Um, I don't know. I don't know the honest answer to that, too. I, I don't know if it's going to break down the question, the, the, the barriers, to be quite honest, because even with that, there are challenges as well. So um, I don't know. I, I think I think it might be a way forward, but there's also discomfort. In it. I think try we it out. yeah try. <laughs> well, um, she is. <laughs> well, I am right. My uh, my husband is from small town Saskatchewan, so um, yes, he is. Yeah. So I don't know if there's a right or wrong answer, and I and I'm and I'm saying every every time you hear me answer, it's like it's a balancing. There's a right or wrong answer. Honestly, I think it depends. I think it's it's the work has to be done among every group. Our racialized group, our transgender group, our person with disability. I think everybody just wants to be seen and valued for who they are. And I think if we make it more about a human issue and about creating a better place for everyone, I think that's the way forward. But I don't know if that's gonna fix the problem. I think that has its own complexities as well. Does that answer your question? No, I, no, not at all. Not at all. Yeah, you have a job. <laughs> yeah, well, my goal is to work myself out of one, right. obviously. Yeah. And I don't mind that. Yeah. Okay. Okay, just stand close by. Just stand close by you. Uh, okay, that is the end of our presentation and the uh, questions. But we have a last question of you. What is your uh, takeaway, um, I guess, direction to us? I think my takeaway would be get curious. I would say embrace the discomfort that comes with this and get curious and do your own work to grow your knowledge and understanding of what those issues are and what they're not. Um, and have some brave conversations would be my takeaway. 